Thank again uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity uh, to give this uh, lecture series in this wonderful place and in this wonderful conference. I'm really having a great time and learning a lot. And I'd also like to thank my audience uh, for their patience and for uh, coming to the third talk. Uh, so what we will do today, uh, we will begin by, okay, uh, the plan is as follows. So if you recall, the first time around, we talked about density of uniformly discrete point set and discrepancy. And uh, then we discussed in the second talk, approximation exponent on homogeneous spaces. And we gave a general geometric lower bound for the approximation exponent. And we really only stated an upper bound for the, approxim an upper bound for the approximation exponent. Today, what I would like to do is to give the barest indication of how this upper bound is proved. The reason for that is that it will involve uh, the, I, the, the, the principle of using, the, uh, duality, or using duality of homogeneous spaces to prove these kinds of results. Duality of homogeneous spaces has been a main point in a number of, of talks, including, of course, uh, Dimitri uh, an hour ago, and um, uh, presumably also later on. And uh, after that, uh, so I'm going to try to explain the use of uh, the effective uh, duality principle. And after that, I'm going to talk about, finally, the subject of the course, intrinsic Diophantine approximation, which I will try to motivate as a parallel or an analog to classical Diophantine approximation. And uh, what we're going to do there is actually try to, well, we will state some results on solution counts. Much more sophisticated results or much sharper results in principle than just the exponent. And if time permits, we'll talk a little bit about spectral estimates in the automorphic representation, but I put that in the end because I think in, the, in a dynamics conference, people are usually a lot less interested in this, so it could be that we will never reach that part. Okay, so uh, we want to talk about the upper bound on the approximation exponent, and let's start by recalling the concrete setup. Uh, where we will demonstrate the main idea for the argument for deriving an upper bound for the approximation exponent. So G is a closed, connected, non-compact unimodular subgroup of SLN. V in Rn is a closed submanifold with G acts acting transitively on V so that we can identify V with a homogeneous space G mod H. And we assume H is unimodular, so V has an infinite invariant measure. Gamma is a lattice, which we assume acts ergodically on G mod H. Those of you who are familiar with Moore's theorem uh, will realize that this is a very, very, uh, very, very weak condition that is satisfied uh, essentially in any interesting case. And um, let us recall the bound of theorem two for the almost sure approximation exponent K G H gamma for the gamma action on G mod H. So recall that we consider the intersection of norm balls in G with a stability group H. So HT is the set of H in H of norm bounded by T. The invariant probability measure on Y, which is the probability space G mod gamma, is denoted by MY, and we define the averaging operators, pi Y beta T, from L to G mod gamma to itself. Uh, once again, it's the usual ergodic averaging operators. You have an orbit of age, the orbit of the point Y, and we sample the values of F on part of the orbit as age ranges over the set capital H T, namely we flow in the orbit, in the age orbit up to, if you like, time T, and we sample the values of F and average them by dividing by the total uh, mass of HT. And we assume that the effective mean ergodic theorem for the averaging operators holds, namely 
that there exists a positive theta such that the time averages along the orbit as they are known, uh, minus the space average of f on the whole on the whole probability space y is bounded by the L2 norm of f and it decays like a negative power of the volume. Uh, okay, so the eta is just a technicality, okay, but it is important to realize, and I didn't say this before, but from the technical point of view, and maybe not even just the technical point of view, this is a truly remarkable estimate in ergodic theory because it's an operator norm estimate. It says that the operate the norm the 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 uh, operator norm of these operators decays at a certain rate. So this result, for example, is uniform on the unit ball of the Hilbert space. Okay, so this is definitely I mean, it's a point worth making. I'm not going to. Uh, say much more about it, but uh, this type of, I mean, this fact drives in the end a lot of the argument that we want to uh, use in our computations. Okay, so uh, we, so assume that age T uh, satisfies the volume growth bounds with rate A, and we let D equals uh, the dimension of the variety. And we assume that the averages beta t supported on h t satisfies the quantitative mean ergodic theorem with rate theta. And then under these assumptions, uh, the Diophantine exponent satisfies the upper bound, which is the uh, previous a priori lower bound d over a multiplied by 1 over 2 theta. And so we will try to explain how spectral theory comes into this picture at all. And we will give a very small, uh, we'll give a small part of the proof which shows how one produces, I mean, ultimately, what we want to produce are lattice elements of a certain bound on, on their norm, which maps one point G, say, to another point, close to another point G naught, which is the point we want to approximate. So we'll give kind of an explanation of the first step in this process. So for a given X naught in G mod H, let us place it in an epsilon neighborhood in G mod H. And then, of course, the epsilon neighborhood, it has volume com com comparable to epsilon to the dimension. So that's very concrete. Uh, on nu epsilon, we have a continuous section from G mod H to G of the natural fibration. And nu epsilon is covered by a small neighborhood O epsilon uh, in G of the point G naught, where G naught, the coset associated with G naught is, is our original point X naught. Uh, of, of, of measure also comparable to epsilon to the dimension. So we, we, you should think of it as, 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 a, as a product set, basically. Yeah, uh, a cylinder. Uh, well, I'm not sure. Yeah, but I'm not uh, going to shrink all of the... Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, for, the, for these purposes, we might as well look at the line and the plane. It's not, uh, in principle, uh, any different. So let chi epsilon be the normalized characteristic function of this uh, neighborhood in G. And so if it's in G, we can periodize it under gamma. So we look at phi epsilon gamma G, which is the sum of chi epsilon gamma inverse G. So we look at the sum of all translates by elements of gamma. And phi being in L2, we, apply to, we, can apply to, we can apply to it the averaging operators that we have. Ah, actually, before that, let me mention, it's absolutely clear that this function phi epsilon, by its definition, is gamma invariant on the left. Right? Okay, that's just the sum over, over gamma. 
<clears throat> in other words, we have a function now on L2 G mod gamma. And so if that's the case, we can apply to it the averaging operators that we define. And so we have our function phi epsilon, uh, and we have to translate it on the right by elements in HT. So that's how the uh, averaging operator work. And we deduce from the effective mean ergodic theorem that the L2 norm of the difference converges to zero at a certain rate. And that's the same thing as saying that the family of functions, uh, the averages of phi epsilon converge in the L2 norm at the definite rate to the constant function, just this integral, which is essentially, which, which we can control very well. It's essentially the volume of O epsilon, and so it's epsilon to the, to the dimension. But the point, well, I mean, this is, uh, of course, uh, ob obvious to everybody who has ever seen the ergodic theorem. The ergodic theorem says that the ergodic averages converge to a constant. That's what they say here in, 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 uh, in, in our case at a certain particular rate. Now, that, of course, implies that if we consider some fixed neighborhood C, let's say, of the identity, fixed neighborhood in G of the identity, and we consider its projection gamma C to a neighborhood of the coset gamma in gamma G. This is just to fix ideas. It's a nice little fixed neighborhood, and it has a certain definite measure, whatever it is. And so if we compare volumes, by which I mean if we keep track of how fast these averages actually become constant, uh, then we can conclude that for all large enough t, the supports of these functions, and remember these functions are almost constant, almost a positive constant. And so the supports of these functions must intersect this little neighborhood because they cannot stay away from it forever. They have to become a constant. Okay, and so that means that for some u in this, uh, in C, uh, we must have, because it intersects the support that the average of phi epsilon uh, at this point, I'm sorry, this age should be, I'm sorry, this age should be, no, it shouldn't be here. So for some uh, u in the, okay, this is the first typo so far, uh, so it's in the support, so uh, it has non-zero value. Now, uh, this means because phi epsilon was defined as a gamma periodization, we just put in the definition of phi epsilon, which was the sum over gamma of these translates. We apply the averages, so we have to average by going over age in HT on the right, and this big sum is non-zero. Okay, and so it follows that for some gamma in gamma, we must have that gamma inverse u age is in O epsilon, where u is in C and age, well, age can only come from age t. Sorry? C is a fixed compact neighborhood, let's say, of the identity coset in G mod gamma. Of, it's a fixed set of positive measure in our probability space. Okay. And so we have obtained a certain element gamma in gamma such that if, if this is going to be non-zero, this gamma inverse UH must be in O epsilon because that's where this function is supported. And so gamma inverse u age is in O epsilon, and we know that age is in HT and u is in C. And that's the same thing as saying that this is just a standard uh, multiplication. It means that gamma is in u age O epsilon inverse. And O epsilon inverse, well, we can see that then we are in a set of the form Q1 HTQ2, 
with Q1 equals C and Q2 equals O epsilon inverse, both compact. And so since HT is defined by a norm, uh, let's say, we obtain an element gamma in gamma with a bound on its norm. This is the bound. Uh, there's some multiplicative constants here, but this is the bound. So this element gamma with a bound on its norm, such that when we look at G mod H, gamma inverse maps the coset UH close to X naught. Why? Because this is equivalent to gamma inverse UH being in O epsilon H, which was our original definition of this neighborhood. And so this is precisely the condition that we have obtained, sorry, where is it? That we have obtained on gamma. And so what did we manage to do? We use the rate in which the, op the averaging operators, uh, well, average or, or, or mix in, in, the, uh, in the probability space in order to find uh, a group element, a lattice element gamma, mapping a point in some fixed compact neighborhood close to our observation point. This is not the end of the story. We want something stronger. We want to say that almost every orbit um, approximates this specific point, uh, G inverse, uh, G, G naught H, at uh, this given rate. So there are a few more arguments that have to be made. And of course, this has to be made a little bit more precise. But basically, the point is that using the effective mean ergodic theorem, we can estimate the size epsilon of the chosen, of the chosen neighborhood O epsilon C and C in terms of T. And this is very concrete. And using this estimate and some further arguments, it can be shown that almost every orbit satisfies the upper bound for the approximation exponent stated in theorem 2. At least I hope that it convinces you that the rate in the effective ergodic theorem will come into the estimate of the norm directly. Um, okay, so okay, so th this is a very um, a very uh, sort of concise and heuristic explanation of part of it. But I hope to convince you uh, that uh, the, the use of spectral theory or, or spectral estimates with uh, this idea of duality is relevant to, this, to these problems. You, you can derive effective estimates from it. And now I would like to say something uh, a little bit more general. Theorem 2 is an instance of the general method of effective duality in homogeneous dynamics, which in general aims to establish properties of the gamma orbits in G mod H by using properties of the H orbits in G mod gamma. This uh, principle has a very long history, and it has many aspects to it. Um, it was used in a lot of different uh, situations in homogeneous dynamics, and um, uh, in the talk by Dimitri and other people as well, we have mentioned the Dani uh, correspondence, which is really uh, um, a, um, well, it's an application of this idea of duality uh, this was already in the early 80s, but it had, duality itself had previous instances uh, to that. And, um, and um, I hope the previous, I mean, I think it's clear from the previous argument that you don't really have to look at just the exponent. Uh, once you uh, dualize, once you transfer from the gamma orbits in G mod H to the age orbits in G mod gamma, there are a number of things that you can do. Uh, when aiming to establish a rate of approximation in G mod age, when ordered by a norm, the dual property which is most pertinent is the existence of the rate in the mean ergodic theorem for ball averages acting on G mod gamma. Uh, but the effective, but, but it's possible to give a fairly, a fairly systematic or a fairly general effective duality uh, principle, and this was developed in joint work with Alex Gorodnik, 
And it yields conclusions which are far more precise than just the existence of a rate. Um, for example, it is possible to prove uh, mean, quantitative mean and pointwise ergodic theorem for the discrete averages supported on gamma orbit points when ordered by a norm, although the optimality of the rate, even if it existed for the exponent, is going to be compromised. So maybe let's take a step back, and, and what, what I'm trying to say now is uh, the following. I, I want to talk, uh, I, I want to say that there is a very nice problem in abstract ergodic theory here. Uh, you have uh, a nice space, G mod age, a homogeneous space, and you have a lot of dense orbits of some group, which happens to be a lattice. In this situation, you can ask about exponent, as we have done extensively, but you can also ask, okay, I want to filter uh, my uh, discrete group gamma by finite sets. And I want to emulate classical ergodic theory, and I want to average functions on G mod H. Well, actually, I want to, to be more precise, I want to sample functions on G mod H using these finite portions of the gamma orbit, and I want to show that they converge to a limit uh, in L2, in L1, in Lp, uh, with a certain rate, um, in, in norm and pointwise. This is a very natural set of considerations for ergodic theory. And indeed, this can be done. And these results complement earlier non-effective results by Gorodnik and Barak Weiss on equidistribution of orbit points ordered by a norm. Of course, Gorodnik and Weiss used a more, a previous, uh, uh, a previous version of the duality principle, which put all the emphasis on the orbit closure, closures using Ratner's theorem. Uh, Ratner's theorem, so because of that, they were able to obtain extremely nice equidistribution results in great generality, but no effective estimates. Um, and uh, they also did a lot of work, which is very important. There are, I can say that there are a lot of surprises in this theory. Um, the limits that you obtained are very surprising, and they do not behave at all like in classical ergodic theory. And so they analyze this to a certain extent. Uh, but effective duality applies quite generally for all uh, locally compact group, closed subgroups, and discrete lattice gamma. And I'll repeat our assumptions here. So this is subject only to natural and necessary assumptions about the growth of the sets HT and of the gamma lattice points in their vicinity. The spectral theory of age in L2G mode gamma and the local behavior of the invariant measure on the homogeneous space. And so uh, in the first talk, in the part that I didn't get to, there was some examples of these equidistribution results um, which demonstrate uh, this idea of effective duality. Okay, and so now what I would like to do, I would like to take a step back and I would like to present uh, what uh, to present a certain definition, you might say, of what we like to call intrinsic Diophantine approximation. And uh, <coughs> I would like to make a very uh, well, a tight as, I, as, as tight as I can, a comparison to classical Diophantine approximation. So we will take a step back. And recall, and so this is just uh, for pedagogical reasons, of course. I mean, all of you are very familiar with this. Uh, so we will start by uh, the standard uh, Dirichlet's theorem in Euclidean space. So what, what does this theorem want to do? We want to measure the uh, quality of approximation of a vector in Rd by rational vectors. We let x uh, denote the maximum norm, and psi in... Um, uh, from R to 0, 1, be a non-increasing gauge function. And uh, one then calls, as we have seen uh, in uh, Dimitri's talks, 
uh, x psi approximable, if there are infinitely many solutions to the Diophantine inequality, that x minus uh, the rational numbers p over q is less than psi q over q. It's another way of writing it. And uh, for example, if psi q is 1 over q to the 1 over d, then every x in Rd is psi approximable. But of course, a lot of the interest here is in functions of psi which have as many logs in them as possible. But this, this is a very basic example. It really does not represent the complexity in Euclidean Diophantine approximation, but uh, well, I mean, we, we uh, will only be able to deal with, um, with less than the most general function. So now, uh, it's absolutely clear that uh, x is psi approximable if and only if it belongs to these cubes uh, with center pq and uh, edge size 2 psi q over q and, uh, and centers p over q infinitely often. This is just the definition. And so the measure of this cube is obviously uh, 2 psi q to the d over q to the d. And so if the sum over all integers uh, with pq, let's say, in the unit cube of the measures of these cubes is finite, or equivalently, equivalently if this series is summable, then it follows immediately from borel cantelli that almost every x, first in the unit cube and then in all of Rd, the Diophantine inequality, the basic Diophantine inequality that we have here, uh, um, <coughs> uh, has only finitely many solutions, namely x is not psi approximable. And as Dimitri said, the convergence case is really very, very easy in these problems, and it often boils precisely to this argument of Borel-Cantelli. The converse is a very famous theorem, which is called Hinchin's theorem uh, in Euclidean space. And it says that if the series actually diverges, then for almost every x in Rd, the system of inequalities, x minus p over q less than or equal than psi q over q, has infinitely many solutions, namely x is psi approximable. And this is a very significant result, very famous result. Uh, but curiously, uh, there is a, a very, very uh, remarkable result. Uh, really, I would per definitely one of or uh, my personal favorites in the theory of the Fentine approximation, uh, which uh, is related to it. Because this theorem um, leaves something very big to be desired. Yes, exactly. Uh, mixing or decay of correlations, as probabilists will, uh, yes, some kind of rough independence, decay of correlations, mixing. Uh, yes, that, that was the original proof, definitely. Um, OK, so this sharp dichotomy giving rise to infinitely many solutions in a divergent case is very pleasant. But it gives rise to the following question, which is really fundamental. Supposing that x is psi approximable, so you do know that there are infinitely many solutions to the Diophantine inequalities. But how many solutions are, you're going, are, are, are there of a given bounded size? I mean, once you see Hinchin's theorem, it's, this becomes a very compelling question. Um, it's one thing to say that there are infinitely many solutions, and it's quite another thing to say that uh, up to size t, you have so many solutions. And uh, that uh, problem, I mean, uh, well, okay, that problem was solved only 40 years later by a really remarkable result by Wolfgang Schmidt. And uh, Wolfgang Schmidt gives a, a really also a remarkable solution in the sense that it's very, very sharp. So you do the obvious thing, namely you define the solution counting function with gauge psi by ntx is simply 
uh, the number of solutions satisfying this bound. So the number of solutions with um, denominator up to t. And then uh, Schmidt introduces the volume growth function associated with a gauge. Namely, he simply sums that series up to point t. And so this will give you a finite number, but of course, this is a series that goes to infinity. Maybe it goes to infinity very slowly, but the whole point is that it go, go, it's going to infinity. And so Hinchin's theorem gives you infinitely many solutions. And Schmidt's theorem is really quite remarkable. It says that the number of solutions is really the partial sums of this series. And even more than that, uh, it gives you an error estimate. So if uh, Vt goes to infinity, namely in the divergence case of Hinchin's theorem, then for almost all x, the number of solutions is really the volume growth, the, the growth of the partial sums, plus an error estimate, which is also actually very, very good. So this is really quite remarkable. Sorry? Log of Vt, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's correct, but uh, I'll check. Um, OK, and so th this is a very, very striking result. And, 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 and so now, uh, let's talk uh, very, very briefly about the Ophantine approximation on, on Yes. 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 Uh, so in Dimitri's talk, there was a very remarkable generalization of Schmidt's theorem. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I should. Did I? Uh, what did I write here? Uh, ah, R D. Yeah. So Schmidt's theorem is in yeah in 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 high, in high dimensions. Um. But now, uh, let, let's, uh, let's uh, note the following problem, uh, which is also a very classical problem in Euclidean Diophantine approximation. Uh, you want to approximate points on a submanifold in RD by the rational points in, in QD. And here, one seeks to prove that points on the submanifold typically behave like a generic point in the ambient vector space. Um, and one classical example which, uh, example which came up uh, earlier this week is uh, this curve, the power curve it is sometimes called, and it has other names as well. Uh, more generally, one can consider smooth submanifolds which are suitably non-degenerate. And these were extensively studied, and this is really a huge topic in the Ophantan approximation. I'm not going to begin to attribute various results here because it's just a motivation. It was worked on by many people and uh, quite a few people in the audience now. And um, what we want to emphasize is that the approximation process here is allowed to utilize all rational points in RD. You, okay, you have a manifold in RD, you have all the rational points, and uh, including those that are off the, uh, the manifold but close to it, and you have your approximation process. And now we get to the origin of intrinsic Diophantine approximation, which was a problem posed by Lang. In his 1965 report on Diophantine approximation, Lang raised the problem of establishing the Diophantine approximation properties of typical points on rational homogeneous algebraic varieties embedded in RD. So this is certainly partly a, a subclass of uh, the manifold we had before. And Lang raised specifically the problem of establishing an analog of Dirichlet's principle, namely what we've been talking all week uh, about, uh, which is exponent of Diophantine approximation, as well as an analog of Hinchin's theorem. And Lang also mentions Schmidt's theorem, which was then recent, as he mentions it very favorably as a, as a challenge. 
But the difference here, and this is really crucial, is that the approximation process is allowed to use only rational points on the variety itself, rather than all rational points in Rd. And that's why we like to call this problem intrinsic Diophantine approximation. You're really only allowed to use the intrinsic rational points. Practically speaking, this is a huge difference because if you take a variety, the variety may be defined by some fairly complicated equations or maybe even, well, some equations. And so the point is you are not allowed to use a rational point unless you show that the components actually satisfy this equation. So first you solve this equation in rational points and only then approximate. Okay, now that is a very, very rich topic, extremely rich topic, and let's go over a few examples. These examples will also serve to demonstrate some of the abstract homogeneous spaces that we talked about yesterday, uh, I don't know, with uh, semi-simple algebraic groups and whatever. Um, but I really want to emphasize that this is very, very concrete. So we start with the unit sphere, definitely a rational homogeneous variety. We can consider the one-sheeted hyperbola. <coughs> completely different variety, non-compact. We can consider the two-sheeted hyperboloid. Uh, we can consider the variety of unimodular matrices, SL2, which was one of our favorite uh, topics so far. We can consider the variety of orthogonal matrices. Uh, we can consider general quadratic varieties, uh, including rational ellipsoids and hyperboloids given by such an equation. We can consider group varieties and more general principal homogeneous spaces, for example, the constant determinant variety. There, we can consider symmetric varieties, spherical varieties, and there's many more. But you can see that this is a very natural problem. You have your rational points. The existence of rational points is never a problem in, in this setup, because this, these are all homogeneous. Uh, homogeneous spaces, so there is a dense group of rational points, and you want to ask yourself, what can you say? What, what can you say in terms of Diophantine approximation by these points? And so what I've just done, I wanted to present three classical problems in Diophantine approximation and ask about their analogs in intrinsic Diophantine approximation. This is a very natural thing to do. And before, before we continue, I would like to say that uh, this is directed uh, to uh, um, uh, maybe uh, uh, graduate students and postdocs, I should say uh, that the vast majority of these problems are open I mean, it's a very complicated picture, and I should also say that this picture is emerging because intrinsic Diophantine approximation doesn't have a 100-year history. Uh, maybe it has a 10-year history. And so it's a complicated picture, but by and large, there are many, many problems here that have really only begun to get some attention. Um, and so, in principle, we would like to establish analogs of Dirichlet's, Hinchin's, and Schmidt's results in intrinsic Diophantine approximation. And like I said, uh, the, the situation is very far from this goal. Uh, there are some partial results. And in, what, in the rest of the talk, I would like to consider an analog of Schmidt's theorem in the most accessible case. I do have to uh, give a caveat before we start. Um, this is an analog. The reason we call it an analog of Schmidt's theorem is because it really does count the number of solutions. On the other hand, maybe we're sort of being unfair because actually Schmidt's result is far, far sharper than anything that we could do at this point. So the novelty in, in what I'm going to say is that we do actually give a solution count in intrinsic Diophantine approximation, 
But in terms of the error rate that Schmidt was able to achieve, we are definitely not there. Uh, yeah. Sorry? Uh, you will uh, learn about this tomorrow. It's a very direct it's a very direct hands-on estimate of various, you know, sets in Euclidean space and their and their intersections. So uh, I, I, we we don't see that these methods are very relevant. Um, so so on the positive side, we will give a solution count in intrinsic Diophantine approximation, but certainly this is not going to be remotely as sharp as the error estimate that Schmitz is able to achieve. Okay, so the simplest, most accessible case is that we will assume that our algebraic group is simple, connected, algebraically simply connected, defined and split over Q. And GR denotes its group of real points. And once again, for those uh, graduate students that are not so familiar with all of this stuff, really you can think about SLNR or the symplectic group and all the results we will mention below are new already in these cases, including SL2R. Um, so, okay. And so, again, for simplicity of exposition, we will consider approximation with denominators which are constrained to a power of a fixed prime. Where the prime P in question, for the prime P in question, the group GQP of piadic solutions is non-compact. And then G Z1 over P is a dense subgroup of G R. And that was the position we were at on Tuesday. So if you if you you can forget about all of these words, we are looking once again at SL2QP and SL2R. And we would like to count the number of of, of um of appro approximants up to a certain size with accuracy epsilon of in, 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 in GZ1 over P um, inside the real group SL2R. So this is very, this is a, um, a sharpening of what we did on Tuesday. Okay, so the first step is to define the solution counting function with gauge psi. And again, for simplicity, with your permission, I will take very simple gauges. It's not the end of the story, but I really do not want to get involved in any complication with the gauge. Um, but the gauge, okay, uh, it, has to, it has a certain upper bound, which is a function of G and P. But okay, we have at least certain gauges. Uh, so the number of solutions is NTG is the number of uh, rational matrices in GZ1 over P whose denominator uh, is between uh, 1 and T and they approximate our, our, our matrix G up to Psi of DR. So this is obviously the natural analog of the Schmidt counting function. And then we have the natural analog of the volume growth function, Vt, which is the sum, h between 1 and t, of the real measure of this small ball in the real group. This is just a little ball around the real matrix G, whose radius is psi h. And here we have the measure, the Haar measure of, in, in GQP of sh, where now SH in GQP is the piadic sphere of piadic height H. Um, this is related to your question of whether we can move from ball, piadic balls to piadic spheres. Uh, and now we have the following results. So uh, given these uh, gauges, and we have allowed on, only a limited, uh, we have some restrictions on the gauges, but given these gauges, there is a certain parameter theta. Uh, this is not the theta that we had before with the ergodic theorem, but it's related to it. 
uh, such that for almost every G, um, no, sorry, here uh, what I mean to say is that for every G in GR, uh, the number uh, the number of solutions is given by the volume growth uh, up to a certain error. Uh, the setup is such, if you're wondering, the setup is such that it's already a priori clear, given our assumptions that this is infinite, or well, more precisely, going to infinity. This is already built into these assumptions. Yeah, because B is, is constrained. So we, we don't get all the way to the sharp, uh, basically, well, to the sharp uh, hinging threshold, but okay. So, and, but, but an important point, I don't know how this got here, but an important point here is that this result is actually uniform. Um, it's for every G. For every G, yeah. This is the isometric case. Ah, no, no, no. Sorry, 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 sorry. I'm confused. I'm confused. Uh, okay, I'm so I'm confused. There's going to be another. I'm confused about this. Sorry. Th this is true as stated. This is what we proved, but we will have a uniform result in a minute. Okay. Uh, okay. And so now. Um, uh, Okay, so this is a kind of a weighted, uh, a weighted um, count. And we can also ask, in a sense, a somewhat uh, simpler problem, uh, which also has to do with solution count. And the reason I want to bring it up is because uh, it is really just another formulation of the notion of discrepancy that we discussed on Tuesday, and so I would like to bring this to a successful conclusion. And so uh, we consider the um, Z1 over P points with bounded denominator. So these are the rational matrices in GZ1 over P uh, with bounded denominator. And this set it's is contained in a compact set WH, in fact, this is the closure, which is the set of G and GQP whose piadic height is bounded by H. So we had precisely this notation on Tuesday, on Tuesday. And we recall that the discrepancy of the family of sets BH in a fixed compact set B in the real group with respect to a suitable Haar measure M is defined by the number of points. I'm sorry, this should be BH. Uh, this should be BH, the number of rational points that fall into B divided by this normalizing function that we discussed on Tuesday uh, is being compared to the Haar measure of B. And uh, remember, and we said that on Tuesday too, that if we take B to be BG delta, this measures the discrepancy at scale delta, and we would like a bound valid also at very small scales. Uh, this is a very important point here. What, what we're asking here is actually quite stringent. We're asking for a situation where you will take an observation point G, then you will take shrinking balls near G. You will shrink the scale, you will take balls in very, very small scales, and yet you will take your rational matrices and they will fall into this very small ball at the right proportion. So the smaller the scale, the more stringent is the, is the obstacle. And so this problem amounts to counting the number of solutions to our Diophantine inequality, G, norm G minus R less than delta, which satisfy that the denominator is between 1 and pH, and comparing it to the size of WH. And um, uh, we, we can state that there is an effective asymptotics for the number of Z1 over P solutions to the Diophantine inequalities on the group variety. 
More precisely, that means that for scales delta equals h minus b, and here again, I have to restrict my b. I cannot do this with scales which are really, really fast, or really, really small. There's going, there is some constraint on the scales, but this is really in the nature of things. Well, in the nature of the proof, maybe I should say. So if you take scales which are given by the piadic height to some negative power, then there's going to be a certain exponent z which depends on b such that the number such that for all g in gr the number of solutions uh, of these rational points with bounded denominators in the small ball is given by essentially the normalizing function uh, function times the measure of the small ball. So it's a certain fraction of the total number here or the total weight here. And the fraction is precisely the Haar measure of the small ball. And this is done with an error estimate, which is strictly less than one. And the implicit constant here is uniform on compact sets. And for this result, in fact, this is true for all G. Uh, it is, it comes into this directly, yes. B certainly depends on that, yes. It certainly depends on the error estimate in the mean ergodic theorem, but several other things as well. And equivalent, equivalently, uh, the following uniform discrepancy estimate holds. Uh, so the discrepancy of the set of rational points with respect to small balls in the real group which is the expression we're used to, uh, the number of rational points in a small ball divided by the normalizing measure, uh, minus uh, the usual Euclidean Haar measure, well, not Euclidean, the usual Haar measure on the real group is estimated by a certain negative power of P ultimately when everything is said and done, but more intrinsically by a negative power of the volume of these height balls. And this is for scales which are constrained, but they still exist, at least some, I mean, we have scales going to zero, uh, and for every G in G, again, we see uniform on compact sets. So that is, th th that is the statement that we have about the discrepancy that we introduced. This is actually, much more, I don't know, much simpler to explain and maybe much simpler to comprehend than the result of Schmidt, which has this mysterious psi function. Uh, the issue with discrepancy in discrepancy is simply counting the number of solutions in a small ball. And this can be done in an arbitrarily small scale. And this, uh, this result is also driven by the, mean, the effective mean ergodic theorem. But this result is really much closer to what you should expect from a mean ergodic theorem. A mean ergodic theorem is used to count all sorts of things. And we are counting something. And the fact that we used it for the exponent, so it's sufficient for the exponent. But in fact, the exponent, in some sense, doesn't use the full strength of the mean ergodic theorem. Okay, so I, I don't have enough time. I, I prepared a few uh, simple uh, heuristic uh, remarks about uh, how to get to this point. I mean, how to, how to get to, to, how to explain this result, but I'm not gonna get into it. I'm, instead, I'm going to make uh, the following remarks. So uh, we are very happy with this solution counting result in the case of the group variety. But I want to emphasize that this problem, as far as I know, is completely open in most other cases, and certainly in most of the other cases that we had in our list. Of course, I should exclude the case of the spheres, for which there are many other techniques associated with 
analytic number theory, so for the spheres there are completely different approaches, but for non-compact homogeneous varieties in general, uh, these problems are really wide open. And uh, so we hope that just as we moved from the lattice point counting problem uh, that we mentioned on Tuesday uh, for irreducible lattices uh, to <coughs> estimates of uh, these um, uh, other results, that th uh, these techniques can be generalized to other varieties. But there are many technical issues to overcome. Um, okay, and um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe I will just say that our approach to the proof of the discrepancy result uh, for group varieties is based on the following ingredients. So we reduce it to the effective solution of the problem of counting lattice points of the subgroup G Z1 over P in variable families of domains in the group GR times GQP. And then uh, we reduce the lattice point counting problem to an effective mean ergodic theorem for the action of the group. Uh, we've already been down this road on Tuesday. Uh, the group GR times GQP acting on this probability space. And as usual, we use spectral estimates in the automorphic representations to bound the norm of the averages appearing in the mean ergodic theorem. So to answer your question, this definitely comes into the exponent. Uh, okay, so I think this is uh, a good place to stop. So thank you very much for your attention.